Friday. Um, I'm busy with projects and stuff for the next year, but I also want to really prepare some things for the early in the new year. Sandy's asked me for dates already. <laughs> so I'll write them all out nice, nicely. Okay. But, you know, for me, just to have been part of this and being part of your your sitting rooms or your lounges, okay, uh, being part of your lives, it really is so wonderful. And as much as the situation has been really bad and that we can't get together, it's given people like myself and my group in South Africa such an opportunity just to share with you and to be with you folks as well. So thank you all for that. Thank you for your friendship. It is so much appreciated. Hey, I wanted to mention something to you. You brought out that uh, Ellen White was speaking in a Sunday church. Well, here in California, we've had a uh, Roman Catholic speak in the Seventh Day Adventist church. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> everything's everything's turning around. Yeah. But, but isn't it wonderful? I actually read the whole book. You know, when I started, I, I haven't slept much the last, because I, I started reading and I couldn't stop reading through this because it was such a revelation that she went through these countries and she was actually, call it naive, okay, that she would go to a Sunday Protestant church and talk to Methodists and about the Sabbath and about hope. And if you read through the whole book, you'll see just those things were overflowing with people. Okay. And Sweden today has quite a big Adventist. In fact, it's, I think probably after Roman Catholicism, the biggest religion in their country. So it's very interesting to see the foundation she laid there and how she traveled through that country. Um, and just the, the fact that people were actually arrested for taking out the truth to to their people because history repeats itself we, we we're gonna get there folks we're getting there very quickly here on this side as well um i'm not quite sure what's happening in your country um we had a meeting yesterday at work and um, my organization is still holding off on mandatory vaccinations but uh, one of our other bigger banks have given their staff an ultimatum to vaccinate by by end of April 2022 or leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a staff component of about 40,000 people. And in South Africa at the moment, um, I think the vaccination rate is running at about 37%. So um, we also had a, a meeting um, at the bank, they had a doctor come in, explain all the pros and cons like everybody does. We've all had it before, but if you look in the chat box, you could see people's concerns. And remember, these are not these are, are Muslims, um, atheists, whatever. Everybody's got the same concern. You want to force us, first of all. Second of all, we, 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 we don't know if this is safe or not. Okay, you're saying it's safe, not a problem with that, okay. But where has the freedom of choice come in? And so sometimes I drop a bit of that into when I train as well, because I talk about freedom of choice in one of my, my modules that I train. Well, the, know, freedom, the, the, the freedom of choice is always there. You just may not like some of the choices. Well, the, 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 the forcing or enforcing of certain things takes away that right. And especially a country that's based on a constitution. Now, you're a, you're a, you're a what is it, a republic? Né? Um, you're a republic? Okay, so you also are based on a constitution, similar to what we are. Okay, Australia is not a republic. Australia doesn't have a constitution. That's why they have already enforced this. Okay, because their citizens have no right to talk back. They have no right. They have to stand by what the, 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 the government decides. It's very unfortunate, you know, it, it's, a, but uh, yeah, so from last week till this week, we, uh, we had the new variant of the virus called, uh, what's it? Um, Omicron. That one. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so you know that, yeah. but by, by the end of the week after we got closed up quicker than, 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 than uh, uh, how would I put it? 
um, I mustn't be ugly, but I nearly said something here. But um, you know, it's 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 quicker than that wallet closing. You know, it's like whatever. Um, we were suddenly just cut off from the world overnight because we supposedly had the thing and we discovered it. But the laughable thing is, it was all over the world already. So they already had cases in the UK, in 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 uh, uh, they, in Australia, uh, in. And the one in Australia was quite interesting because they had, the most cases are actually in Australia, in a country which you cannot enter unless you go through, you are vaccinated, okay? You've gone through a 10 day, uh, uh, um, what is it? Um, quarantine. quarantine, quarantine, okay? And you've had, a, I think, three of those, what they call PR tests or whatever. Yeah. People are still getting this thing, okay? So what does that say? Makes you think. So yeah. Okay. Anyway, Sandy. Uh, that, Sandy, I'm uh, growing. I'm growing feathers at the moment. That subject. So I'm, that's. I'm going to be flying your way soon. Okay, I don't see um, Donnie on here yet, but I'm sure he'll he'll arrive I'll here soon. He well, said eleven o'clock sharp. That's what will. he said. That's ten minutes. Okay. There's, there's, there's Merlin and Marvin yeah. and Evelyn. Yeah, are, are, you, are you having a get-together there today? You have a visitor. <laughs> we have visitor what? here. Uh, <laughs> it's Eddie. Is it Hi. Eddie? Yeah. Hello, Eddie. <laughs> Where's Marvin? Oh, he's camera shy. His camera side. I'm gonna gonna look around the corner. Oh, there's that. <laughs> I was looking at that and I didn't know Eddie was there, and I'm like, that's Eddie, that's not Marvin. <laughs> we see you, Eddie, sitting there looking all serious. Well, anybody is sitting like that, okay? If you sit like that in the bank, okay, there's there's only one or two things. You're either the bank manager saying no, or you the client saying, Why are you saying no? <laughs> body language body language Eddie. body language and hi ed and linda Glad also means i'm not listening to you <laughs> <laughs> it's a defensive position it's actually not he's he's, he's actually cold he's sitting like that because he's cold yeah, isn't that, that, that so, could Eddie? that could be no <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have my toes crossed or my fingers crossed or my legs crossed. Just my arms. <laughs> <laughs> he escaped the snow of Idaho early. Yeah, so so you come to California to escape the snow in Idaho. Yeah, there's some things I need to do down here. So Okay. All right. We'll see how long I'll stay. Okay. So Sandy, um, this is the last time for this month. It's uh, our next one. I'll do is next month. Is that is that what we? Okay. All right. We're all full for uh, December. You can still come visit. Of course, I'm coming every weekend. What do you think? <laughs> oh, don't you want me here? Must I now leave? I'll be here. Leave. Of course, we want you here. That's good. Mm. It was raining the whole of today and yesterday. We have got such tropical rains at the moment. It's like the Philippines, Ethelin. You know, it uh -huh. just it rains and it rains like in the summer. It just doesn't stop. Okay. And now we've developed a termite problem. So I had to put special non-poisonous stuff for the dogs down for termites because it's eating every all the wood around here. So yeah. Huh? In the Philippines, if it doesn't rain for a week, there will be drought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Philippines is beautiful. Oh. The biggest rain I've been in was when I was in the Philippines. Oh, Absolutely God. poured. <laughs> Maybe it's a typhoon already. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a it's a country I still want to go visit. 
Because hmm. I, I had friends working there at one stage and um, uh, yeah. I followed them on, on, what is it? They had a YouTube channel, which they showed all these Chow, Ma, Chow, Ma, Chow Mai. Uh, Hi, that's Daniel. Philippines, isn't it? Chow what? Mai. Uh, Chow Mai, that Philippines, or where's that? Chow Mai. Thailand. Is that Thailand? Okay. Oh, okay. it's in the Philippines, Thailand. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just, I, I, I look at these places, there's the most beautiful, just the most beautiful things there. Um, Chiang Mai is uh, famous for the Chiang elephant. That's the right, elephant. Chiang Mai. That's the place, yeah. Yeah, but you must come to South Africa. We we we've we've got what we call the Naisna elephants here. So Naisna is a is a, a very big a reserve elephant reserve on the east coast of South Africa, low near to Cape Town. Okay, and um, very famous books have been written about those elephants. Mm -hmm. We will <laughs> come visit. Yeah. <laughs> Bring you and you bring Sandy along, ne? You bring oh, yeah. Sandy along. Yeah, yeah. Sandy will and say broadcasting from South Africa. <laughs> well, I tell you, when that day happens, I'm going to sing so loudly in my false voice. <laughs> but then all of you need to come. Okay, we 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 can we can we can put Violet and and, and Carol in in business class. <laughs> and all of the rest of us flee, fly fly cattle claws. <laughs> Some of us don't. There was a way to drive, but uh, I will never fly. I will never fly. We'll, bu we'll build you a tunnel or a bridge. No problem. <laughs> we'll put you on a boat. That's no. what I started to say. There's boats. I don't want a boat. I, don't want to do, I just drive. That's all I can do. <laughs> a big bridge or something, but I'm... I, well, you can it has nothing to do with anything going on now. I just... You can run your car up on the uh, uh, boat and make it to the nope. bridge. Nope. <laughs> I um, got a passport and everything not long before Daddy passed away. He got his done and I got one and I thought I'd go somewhere with him and he had to go to sleep. So I'm done. So Daniel, where are you from? <clears throat> I know I've seen your name. I'm from Montana. I'm Dan and Carolyn's friend. I just haven't been on. Oh, for I knew I knew that name. Okay. <laughs> All right. She just mentioned your name. I think a couple days ago. Carolyn. Your name. Yeah, we. Yeah, we've been in. Uh, we've moved, and it's been oh, kind of hectic. So. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just your name. Yeah. So are you are you anywhere close to them? The yeah, camp? we live about 45 minutes from them. Although I've been so busy, I haven't really visited them too much except for once or twice this summer. Because they can't get on here. They can go yeah. watch you two, but you're going to have to uh, get over there and, and let them get on here to see everybody. Yeah, our internet's uh, yeah, we've been in, uh, we've moved Corbin, kind of honey, honey, Corbin, you can't have them both on at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, he's trying to watch me on YouTube, brother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, nice noise. Yeah. Sandy, uh, I see, I see Donnie on on the 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 attendees list. Oh yeah, he's on the bottom down there. He's number check him. He's trying. He's chomping at the bit. Only way, tell them hi, Daniel, when you see him, and tell him you saw us on here. I will do that. I just talked to him last night, so. <laughs> uh. Carol, you and I got the same memo today, ne? Red. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You there, Daniel? We are um, Daniel. Looking at his name, Donnie.
Your name's on both places, Donnie, so <laughs> you might want to go out and come back. I don't know. Yeah. That's what Violet and I had to do. Yes. Hmm. Now we lost Sandy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you know that mice like flowers? See that oh. plant over my shoulder? Yeah. It's a chrysanthemum plant, and it had five beautiful plants, uh, flowers on it. And one morning I got up, and, and all the flowers were gone, and there was mouse tracks all around. Uh. Did you I ever was think amazed. Yeah. Don't you think that's sweet? What? Don't you think that's sweet? Oh, <laughs> Well, I have another plant in my living room, a big one that had flowers and they ate all the flowers out of it. The mice? <laughs> the mice. Yeah. Just get well, I'm them. not here alone. Get rid of the mouse tracks, and then that'll tell the I problem. I have mouse traps <laughs> all over the house. Yeah. And I can't catch the one. One yeah. time we had some colorful mouse tracks. They got into the kids' crayons. <laughs> <laughs> It's you, you people what are, they like. Oh, you people Thank in America, you, Violet. Uh, Violet, you you folks in America are so 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 uh, um, uh, 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 lucky. You even have vegetarian mice. Yeah. In our in our country, the mice chases the cats here. Oh goodness! Well, when I was little, we lived on the ranch. When my daddy'd find a nest of baby mice, and mama was dead. He'd bring it to me, and I'd raise them on my doll bottle and turn them loose. <laughs> well, I guess instead of putting cheese on your mouse traps, you're going to have to put flowers on them. Yeah. That's an idea. They like bananas, too. I told you, vegetarian well, mice. Mm -hmm. I, I left a banana out, and the next morning they had eaten the end off of it and part of the banana. Well, my stars. <laughs> I can't get rid of them. Did your grandson ever come? Oh, yeah. He came and he's in the exterminating business. And all he did was put out mouse traps all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> he <Y> put that. <laughs> they didn't catch a mouse. Maybe you can borrow Sandy's cat for a day or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was Are thinking the same. That cat, she might get a bug. Yeah. Get a bug, but she and a lizard. I I saw that she got a lizard, but she's <laughs> she's been in the house all her life and she's 12 and she could care less. She just looks at him like Yeah, let that's him go. Probably her friends. <laughs> my, probably my, son, my son has two dogs that work as a tag team. Yeah. One, one flushes them out and the other nabs them. <laughs> I was just about to say, Dave, I've got the same. I've got a Jack Russell and my little tripod. Yeah. And the, the little female is quicker than the Jack Russell. And she took out um, um, one of these birds that flies into the house to come and, and eat the pellets, the dog's pellets in the, in the kitchen, which drives Diane nuts. Uh. That little tripod was waiting for it and it took it out ah. this week. <laughs> so it's been eyeing it for, a, for like six months now. Oh. And she's like lightning. You can't believe a dog with three legs moves that fast. <laughs> oh. Life is interesting. Very. Especially if you live in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and Zoom says I was removed by a host and can't log on. What? Oh.
needs to reset his computer again. Yeah. Log in and out, yeah. According to my watch, he's only two minutes late. Well, he's trying to get on. <laughs> so he's yeah. not really late. He just can't get on. Violet and mine is nine hours and two minutes late. <laughs> well, we lost Sandy again. She's probably talking to him. It's either Zoom or the internet having a problem. I think I think okay. it's Zoom because it's been acting yeah. funny for a couple of us. I don't know. It's 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 got updates. Um, I updated earlier this morning. Um, uh, I did something for for my group, and um, it it showed two updates, two patch updates. So maybe just check your updates or just run an update. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely yeah. updates that came through today. Yeah, maybe their server's overloaded. A lot of people use Zoom now. Yeah. Well, well, well. I just want to ask you guys: Can you remember the first time you went on Zoom and how foreign it felt? And here you are. What is it, a year later? Eighteen months later? Two years later? Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know, you you can actually troubleshoot problems that come up and <laughs> sort out things, and you've got backgrounds and. We got Violet there sitting, and she's she's actually got the right light behind her, you know. And it's like, wow, you know, she could work in a Hollywood studio. And we got Carol there, and she's got the painting in the background, and Dave with his marvelous uh, background there. It looks like he's sitting in a restaurant, okay, French restaurant, but it's a it's painting, man. Actually, eh? a couch. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, this is real. It's not a background. It's a picture. It's a picture, yeah. I see this painting or something, yeah. I could see, yeah. But yeah, but it's, yeah. it's so fantastic how we've changed. We just adapted. Mm -hmm. It's just like on Sundays, my family goes on FaceTime from Google, and we all get to see each other. Yeah, oh. yeah. That means you so have to I, your I look a whole lot, but I've still. Computer illiterate. <laughs> oh, me too. Well, on Tuesday night, I go to this law Zoom thing, and it deals with paperwork against government officials. And there has been over 200 people on those at times. Mm. And oh. there will be about 15 or 20 people. They they put their – there's a little thing that says put their hand up. Hands and up, that's yeah. A, and that's what the next person does, the questioning. Yeah. Keith, you talk about that, okay? Uh, in the last month, um, I trained uh, a series of talks on fraud and stuff uh, for the bank, and my average was four to six hundred people on. And then yesterday, when they had the COVID presentation um, at the bank, there was four thousand eight hundred people on. Wow. Four thousand eight hundred people on that thing. So you'd see the participants list on the right hand side here. It's list like you can see 4,800 blah, 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 people yeah. attending. Mm. <laughs> yes. That's a lot. That's a lot. The good the good thing about Himes is that he's got the, the gift to speak. Yeah. You can speak to a large crowd really good. Maybe because you're you do banking. You got that gift to speak to people. Um, you get, uh, um, I, I always tell people it's the only gift God gave me. Okay. Because <laughs> that and selling to people, but, um, um, you get people in the bank, obviously that, that are very introverted. Um, and so they normally go into the back offices. They work in, in fulfillment or credit or risk or things like that. Um, I spent 25 years of my career. Um, being a relationship manager, so talking to business. There he is. Hey, Donnie's back. 
Hey, hey this time it was. There you are. He was he was here on time. It was my fault. Oh. Hey, Ty. Get that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I take the blame. It's good to see you, Brother Ramey. Uh, you too. You too, Brother Baxter. I haven't heard that in a while. Yeah. I, oh, I just... <laughs> I just came back from the Lindsay Church, so anyway, anyway, yeah, welcome, happy Sabbath. Yes. Oh, already. Uh, we're going to do the ninety-fifth Psalm and right. the Fourth Commandment. I think we should. I think you, should. Yeah. you have it on the screen, Sandy. I'm trying. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Let's begin, 95th Psalm, verse 1 through 7. O come, let's sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep place of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let's worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And by now everyone should know this from memory, because we're told to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Raymond. Ready, huh? Ready. <clears throat> okay. Don't know where you are, but where we are, it's a little foggy still. Uh -huh. Larry. Although... As I got towards the foothills this morning in Lindsay, it was perfect. So came back in from the Lindsay church and uh, right back to the fog again. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, welcome. Welcome. Hope everybody had a good week. Um, anyway, glad to see you here. <laughs> uh, we've talked about this before, but it's been a while and I thought, you know, wouldn't hurt to talk about this topic again. Wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. Some of you may have even forgotten what I said about it. Maybe. And so, <laughs> and so, hey, we're gonna we're gonna look at it again today. Um, I heard somebody. I heard a pastor a long time ago. He said, "You should uh, grow where you're planted." You ever heard that one before? Grow where you're planted. And I. I forget the topic. I forget what how the, the subject came up exactly. But we were just talking about, you know, God puts people in certain places to do certain things. And if we're if we're going above and beyond what he has called us to do, you know, there could be trouble. There could be trouble um, because we're not, you know, we're not focusing on the ministry um, that God wants us to. Matter of fact, you might might twist that saying around a little bit and say, hey, you know, you'll be more effective in ministry if you work or grow where God has planted you. So if if God wants you in a certain place and has put you there and has given you a ministry, that's what you need to do. And the, the character we're going to look at today, we're going to look at three. We're going to be talking about Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and, and, um, and again, I know we've talked about this before, and I know many of you are familiar with this story, but we're going to focus probably and particularly on, on Miriam today, and before we start beating her up a little bit, you know, figuratively, <laughs> you know, I want to I wanna, I wanna say this, I want to say this, I want to say, you know, her character was clearly shown when she was watching her little brother in the Nile, you ever thought about that? That it took, it took a certain amount of bravery, I mean, you know, and responsibility for this young girl 
to be sitting there and and watching her little brother, you know, um, in a sense, uh, keeping guard on her brother as they're hiding him there. And, and not only that, I mean, she's the one, think about, think about this. Another point of her character, we see almost a boldness as well. Isn't she the one that goes up to the princess and makes a suggestion? So, you know, she, she does have a lot of positive traits in her character. And um, found this quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 382. And this describes Miriam as well. This describes her as well. But it, what it does is it, it starts out positive and then it gets to where we're going to talk about today, this quote from Ellen White. And it reads this way, again, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 382. Her self-control, meaning Miriam, her self-control and tact, God had made instrumental in preserving the deliverer of his people. So that's kind of what we just talked about. It made her instrumental. What does that mean? That, mean, that means she was extremely important in saving Moses, okay? Richly endowed, she go, Ellen White goes on, richly endowed with the gifts of poetry and music. So she had two spiritual gifts that God give, gave her, poetry and music. Miriam had led the women of Israel in song and dance on the shore of the Red Sea. And then we stop right there for a second because we're going to get, this is going to switch us over a little segue, if you will, into what we're going to be talking about today. But, and man, back to the quote, back to the quote on page, on page 382. But the same evil that brought discord in heaven, what does that mean? The same evil that brought discord in heaven, the very same evil that, that uh, uh, got into Lucifer's mind, got into hers. But the very same evil first brought discord in heaven, sprang up in the heart of this woman of Israel. And she did not, she did not fail to find a sympathizer in her dissatisfaction. So I want you to think about a couple things here. A couple things here with that quote. One is just because you are convicted, you are right, doesn't make you right. Would you agree with that? Just because you're convicted you're right, it doesn't make you right. And, and number two, something else to consider before we get into uh, Numbers chapter 12, we can always, isn't it true, we can always find someone to bring along with us <laughs> in our griping, complaining, and doubting. Isn't that true? It seems to be really easy to find someone that, that will just join right in with us like it does like it does for Miriam here. So let's go ahead and get ready to open our Bibles. And like I said, we are going to be in Numbers 12, and we're going to start right in verse 1. Sorry, one more drink. Okay, let's have a word of prayer as we open up God's word. Father God, we ask for your presence today. We ask for your spirits today as you guide and lead us through this passage. And I pray, Lord, that it'll open up our minds maybe a little bit in some way. Maybe we'll see a little knit. We'll see a little uh, bit that we haven't uh, seen before. And it'll be something that will help us to grow and draw us closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. Numbers, and we're going to start right off in verse 1. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. So, just to set the scene a little bit, this is right after um, the quail have been sent by the Lord. All right, here we go. Verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. All right. Then we have our, our little telltale word, because. It's going to explain why. Why did they complain against Moses? And I, another thing I want to think about in this story was that the real reason they're complaining. Okay. All right. We're going to get to that. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian, Ethiopian woman whom he had married. And then... And then to emphasize that point, the next phrase, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So 
they are complaining. And, and who is their sympathizer? Ellen White calls him, calls him a sympathizer. Her sympathizer is Aaron. But we're going to get to Aaron in a minute here. We're going to get to Aaron in a minute here. So here they are. Now, can you imagine Moses? Here's Moses and all the problems that have taken place so far. You know, they're complaining about not having meat, right? They have the Red Sea. You know, they had all of these things going on. And you just wonder if Moses is sitting there going, you got to be kidding me, right? I mean, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Moses is probably saying, what the human side of Moses is probably saying, what now? What now? And the Message Bible, the Message Paraphrase, it, it, it throws this idea in behind his back, you know, behind his back. And um, let's be clear, and Ella White says this as well, you know, Aaron and Miriam had occupied a position of high honor and leadership in Israel. They were a part, if you would like to call it, they were a part of the leadership team. They weren't not in the leadership team. They were part of the leadership team. But just like that quote we had in Patriarchs and Prophets to begin, that, that envy and that jealousy starts to appear in Miriam's heart. And so what happens is the sin starts with her, self rises, evil comes, and you, and you have to start going, nothing good is going to happen out of this, right? The envy builds in her heart. Self rises, evil comes, and so we just can't sit back and expect anything good to happen. Now, think about what had happened also with Jethro. Okay, who is Jethro? Well, Jethro is Moses' father in law. Okay, and remember, he had advised on the divided responsibilities, he didn't consult, he didn't consult Miriam or Aaron either, and so it wouldn't be a surprise. If, um, you know, they were a little jealous about that as well. But, but remember what, what's happening here with Miriam and Aaron. They are using Zipporah because she is a Midianite, uh, you know, to, to reason out their cause. You know what I mean? Saying, well, Moses married this person. But, but as we're going to find, that clearly is not exactly what their problem is. Okay? All right. Now, Ellen White gives us, a, there's a lot of good stuff here in Patriarchs and Prophets. I want to share this with you. So the other little note we get here, like, a, like, a, like I like to say, that little Paul Harvey moment behind the scenes. And Ellen White says this. She says, the wife of Moses was a Midianite. And so thus a descendant, and you some of you know this, a descendant of Abraham. In personal appearance, she differed from the Hebrews in being of somewhat darker complexion. Though not as an Israelite, so there, there's almost this little bit of racism, right? We see this little play of racism here. So, but then Ellen White throws out this qualifier about Zipporah, and this is good stuff, okay? They're sitting there complaining about who Moses married. Her skin's a little darker. Her, her father had advised Moses about dividing responsibilities and hadn't asked them about it. And then Ellen White adds this little qualifier, like I said, Zipporah, and this is important to think about, was a worshiper of the true God. I don't know how you can beat that, right? I mean, how can you be, you should be very happy for your brother or your sister if their spouse is what? A worshiper of the true God. OK, and I know some of you could talk about this as well. It is very difficult, isn't it, when your spouse does not believe the way you do. But here here is Zipporah, a believer in God, just like they are, just like they are. But yet they're using her as some kind of excuse here. OK. So but we're, we're, what I believe we're going to see in the next verse is it goes way beyond her. It goes way beyond, beyond her. Look at verse two. So they said, and remember, they're using her kind of as an excuse, but then look what happens here in verse two. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? <laughs> has he not spoken through us also? And then look at this next sentence. You got to like this part. And the Lord heard it. 
I don't know about your Bible, but my version here in the New King James, it has it in italics. So what does that mean when it's in italics? That means it's emphasized. So they said, so they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. So they start off with this very weak argument about Zipporah and, and she shouldn't marry Moses and her skin's a little bit different, you know, and all of these things. But you see what they're doing. You see what they're doing. Here's what they're doing. They are claiming, what are they claiming? They are claiming that they are equal to Moses. Isn't that what they're saying? They're saying, hey, look, God spoke through us as well. Why, why is Moses so special? Why is Moses so special? But see, God heard all the whining. He heard all the whining. He heard all complaining. Okay. Now, I want you to think about, here's another qualifier, if you will. Back to patriarchs and prophets. Listen to what Ellen White says about this situation here. She says, God was the center of authority and government. So at this time in Israel, God is a center of authority and government. The sovereign of Israel. Moses stood, Ellen White says, Moses stood as their visible leader by God's appointment to administer the laws in his name. So who was God's appointed leader? Moses. We know that. But here we have Miriam and Aaron. Again, the, the real crux of the issue, the real problem is they are jealous. It, it may not have to do with his wife at all, period. None of it. They were just completely jealous because didn't God speak through us too? Shouldn't we have some kind of say so? And then as I'm reading through this story, I have to thinking about this. I'm thinking, you know what? Aaron, Aaron, how dare you? Think about Aaron. Aaron better remember. <laughs> Aaron better remember how Moses stood by him after what? Remember the golden calf thing, right? Remember Moses stood by his brother when God was angry about the golden calf? Remember that? And, but here he is complaining about Moses. And I'm thinking, you, you know, you, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. Here was, you know, you remember Aaron? You remember what he says? You know, it, it's, it's almost comical if it wasn't so sad. Here, he says, well, we just threw all the jewelry into the fire. And out came what? A calf. It just kind of, you know, if you listen to Aaron's excuse, it's like, ah, oh, it just kind of happened, right? It just kind of happened. We took all this jewelry, whew, we threw it into the fire, bam, it just came out a golden calf, right? So I'm thinking, Aaron, come on, you're you're better than that, man. You're better than that. Your brother's your brother took up for you. But I want to stop here for a second and, and think about this. And again, I, I believe it's one of those things that we all we all can understand. Isn't it true that betrayal by those closest to us is a greater trial than the hate of our enemies? Our enemies may hate us, and it's different. They are our enemies. I hope our family's not our enemy. But it makes a, a huge difference when it's a brother or a sister or a mom or a dad that has what betrayed us or a spouse, then it hurts. Then it hurts even more than from what we would consider an enemy. All right. And here is Ellen White's insight again on page 384. Like this, this is good stuff. She says, she wrote, I should say, smarting under the supposed neglect shown to herself and Aaron, she regarded the wife of Moses as the cause concluding that her influence had prevented him from taking them into his counsels as formally. So back to Zipporah again. Somehow they're blaming her that Moses, that Moses didn't bring them into these private counsels with God, I think, right? But here, here's the other thing about Aaron. We're going we're gonna to hit on Aaron one more time here. You think about this. Miriam goes to Aaron, right? And Ellen White makes it very clear. It, it started in her heart, okay? But she goes to the, what's Aaron's position? You remember Aaron's position here right now? He is the high priest of Israel, right? We don't want to forget that. But she goes to him. 
she finds a sympathetic ear. And when he agrees with her, what happens? It gives her cause what I'd like to call traction. It gives her cause traction. You know, if, if, if Aaron would have just said, stop, that's enough. Stop right there. You know, hey, you're going too far. You're going too far. It's not about Zipporah. You know, that's not really the problem. Moses is the leader. God has appointed him. We're part of the leadership team. Everything's okay as far as that goes. But no, he sympathized, going back to that word again, he sympathizes with her and boom, all of the sudden her cause becomes, like I said, it gives, it gives her traction. Her cause all of a sudden becomes real. She's, you imagine when somebody backs up your opinion, you know how good it feels. You know how good it feels. And sometimes even more so when we're complaining and somebody sympathizes with our complaining, whether we're right or wrong, we feel a lot better. Oh, you know, they understand what I'm going through. They understand what I feel. But see, that's exactly what happened here. Okay, let's get back to the word here. And remember that little phrase? Remember that little phrase there at the end of verse two? <laughs> and the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. The Lord knows what's going on. Well, he always knows what's going on. All right. Now, verse three gives us a, a little bit of insight into Moses and also into the fact that they really had nothing to complain about. Listen, listen how scripture describes Moses in verse three. Now, the man Moses was very what? What's that word? Humble. More than all the men who were on the face of the earth. So who is the most humble person in the whole world at this time? It's Moses. It's Moses. How could they have a complaint against their, not one, their own brother? Two, he's been appointed by God. And three, scripture tells us that he was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Okay? All right. Now, verse four, you know that all, you know that saying you've been called out, you know, you've been called out literally and figuratively here, the, they're going to get called out in verse four. Look at this. Check this out. Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam. Okay. Again, we don't know how close by Moses was to begin, but he talks to all three of them now. He says, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So it's like, step outside. We need to deal with something here that doesn't need to happen in the tabernacle. There's something we need to deal with that you need to be outside here. Okay? You need to be outside here. All right? So the three came out. All right. Verse five. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called to Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. So all three of them are out. The Lord, who is the Lord in this place? Who's the Lord who speaks? It's right Christ in his human form in some way. So he can, you know, maybe not in a complete human form, but in a form that they can hear and approach, right? He calls them outside, all right? And I want you to think about this too, as far as leadership goes. Moses, the Bible tells us, very humble. Is, is humility important in a leader? Of course. Is Moses meek? Yes. But was he courageous? Yes. He wasn't domineering, it sounds like. But this kind of character sometimes takes a while to develop. But that humility of character, I, I, it just makes somebody a better leader. It just makes somebody a good leader, right? Well, why? Because they're approachable. They listen to what you have to say. And, and like I said a few seconds ago, they aren't domineering. You know, when, when they're giving out instructions, they're thinking about the people that they're talking to. They don't, at least here's a good old saying, they don't put on airs. You know, remember that, remember that old saying? OK, he does it with humility. He knows he's speaking 
He knows he's speaking from God. Okay. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, how did that happen? Because Moses was raised in royalty, right? He decides to free the people on his own. He kills an Egyptian. He runs for his life. Okay. But what happened to him? Well, let's let's read it directly from a spirit of prophecy here. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 384. This is what happened to Moses, okay, in his spiritual growth. Look at what happened. She writes this. She says, the experience gained during the years of toil and waiting in Midian, the spirit of humility and long suffering there developed that prepared Moses to meet with the patience and the unbelief and murmuring of the people and the pride and envy of those who should have been his unswerving helpers. Miriam and Aaron, by their murmurings, were guilty of disloyalty. And then she adds this little kicker right here. Not only their appointed leader, but to God. Since they weren't following Moses the way they were supposed to, they were guilty of disloyalty, not just to their brother, but to God himself. So here's what Ellen White's saying. She's saying, look, how did Moses turn around? How did he get like this? It was being out in the wilderness by himself. And what does she say here? I want to get, I want to get that quote right. Um, the spirit of long suffering were developed, prepared Moses to meet. So as he's out there working, as he's out there waiting, he develops this character of humility that allows him to be. <clears throat> excuse me, that allows him to be a better leader, okay? All right, now let's get to verse six, okay? Here we go. <clears throat> this is what God says now. So God's called him out, and let's go back to exactly what it says. Let's go back to five and come into six. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. So like the judgment seat, right? Come on up <clears throat> or listen up. And they both went forward. So they stepped towards the Lord. And then he said, verse six, then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, <clears throat> this is good stuff. I, the Lord, make myself known to him in vision. I speak to him in a dream. So God says, look, if there's a prophet, I give him visions. <clears throat> if there's a prophet, I give him dreams, right? He's, he's explaining to them how he, we're going back to that word qualify. We're using it a lot today. I didn't know if we would or not, but <clears throat> he's saying, look, here's the quality. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to speak to him in dreams and I'm going to speak to him in visions. Excuse me one second. Okay. So one of the questions I have about this story and really about leadership, especially spiritual leadership altogether, you know, how do we know if a leader has been chosen by God? How do we know? You know, and it seems like from verse six here that um, God makes themselves known to this leader. He communicates with the prophets this way. We could look at Joel, Joel 2.28 and Amos 3.7. And promises to continue doing that. Okay, he promises to continue doing that. So God says, this is what I do for prophets. This is what I do. I make myself known to them in visions, and I speak to him in dreams. Okay, leaders are important. Prophets are important, God is saying. But then, but then they, he, he kind of, he kind of says, okay, this is what I do for prophets, okay? And then he starts to explain in verse 7. Look, look what God does here. Then he says, not so with my servant Moses. So it's almost like he's saying, okay, this is what I do with prophets, but this is what I do with Moses, okay? Moses, it's a little different with Moses, and he explains why. Look at this. Not so with my servant Moses. So it's almost this idea is Moses is above a prophet. OK, and and the the again, the qualifier for being above a prophet, it, look what it is here. Not so with my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. OK, which means 
He's faithful to my people, my house. It refers to his people, okay? Then look what he does in verse eight. Look what God does in verse eight. He sets them up in verse seven. He says, no, it's not the same with your brother Moses. It's not what I do. It's not what I do with Moses. This is what I do with Moses because Moses is above a prophet, okay? Look at verse eight. I speak with him what, if I could hear you, (laughs) I speak with him what? Face to face even plainly and not in dark sayings and he sees the form of the lord so moses i speak to face to face moses is above a prophet okay then god adds this at the end of verse eight why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant moses why weren't you afraid to do it You see the way, you know the way, I'm telling you the way I communicate with him. So Moses is more than a prophet. He is the leader of my people. He is faithful in all my house, okay? But yet you are still griping and complaining. And and I think this is really important here. The word that's used, why then were you not afraid? I'm going to tell you. We were talking about this at school yesterday. Some of the teachers and one of the librarians, we were talking about this at school yesterday. What's one, what's one of the main problems with kids today? Yeah, it's a lack of respect. There's no doubt about that. But there is a lack of fear. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I'm not talking being deathly afraid of being killed. I, I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, and we were talking about this yesterday, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with a little healthy Fear of consequences. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? My dad, my dad, we weren't that close. Um, but, you know, we got along. We weren't that close, though. But I knew. I knew because I had he was he was a he was a spanker. He wasn't afraid to uh, <laughs> spare the rod. Anyway, it's funny. But I knew. I knew there was that little fear in the back of my mind of punishment. There's a little fear in the back of my mind of punishment. Now, it didn't mean I didn't get in trouble. I got in trouble many, many times. From the golf club incident all the way to the dart gun incident. We'll talk about that some other time. But but the dart gun and the golf club incident. Anyway, but I, I had that healthy fear of punishment. And, and it's totally gone. It, it's just totally gone in kids. And again, I'm not talking about beating somebody. I'm talking about, you know, a good swift smack on the behind or whatever it is. And, and see, at school, you remember this? You remember this? You guys are old enough to remember this. Yeah, you remember the principal and the paddle. I remember the principal when I was in elementary school over on the coast. The paddle was hanging up on the wall behind his desk, you know. A little healthy fear when you went to the principal's office and you were looking at that paddle up on the wall thinking, hmm, yeah, yeah. Thought tw- now, look, it doesn't mean I didn't get the paddle. It happened one time. It wasn't my fault. And that we'll talk about it another time. It wasn't my fault. But the only point I am as I'm going on with this boring story is that we were just talking about yesterday at school how kids have no fear because the schools can't punish them. They don't punish them anymore. They're out there picking up trash or they're helping the principal in the office. They don't, they don't really have any kind of consequences that they're worried about because, and, and I'm not saying it isn't important because we do want to win kids' hearts, but, you know, we also can win them over with discipline, you know, eventually. And I've read some, I've read some things about this <clears throat> that backed up, well, you can read any, you can find things to the back of your opinion on just about anything. But this one article I was reading was when kids don't have discipline, they don't think they're cared for, you know, and when they do have discipline, they do realize eventually, I'm not saying right away, but eventually they realize, hey, my parents cared about me. My parents love me. They put boundaries on me. And it's totally missing in our society today. You see it all the time in public school, all the time. And so it's interesting because God uses that phrase. Why then were you not afraid? 
If you knew Moses is above a prophet, if you knew I appointed him as leader, what is your problem? I don't speak to him in dark speeches. And, and one version of the Bible even says translated riddles. He sees the visible form of me. And I speak to him face to face. You see, Miriam's mistake was speaking against God's appointed authority. And God is saying, why did you think that was okay? Why did you think that was okay to do that? Now, here comes time for some of these difficult things for me. Now, me personally, about this story. And so I'm just going to share you share with you some of my difficulties. Okay? Because believe it or not, David, believe it or not, David, I don't have all the answers. I know you're surprised, but I do not have I do not have all the answers. But I think one of the questions that this story it begs the question, I think, that is there ever a time to withhold respect from leaders that are appointed by God? Is there ever a time that needs to happen? When do they lose that privilege? Think about this. Even Jesus considered the Pharisees, you know, he condemned the Pharisees, I should say. He condemned the Pharisees, <coughs> but he still encouraged the disciples to cooperate with them. You know, we're loyal to them, even if they err in judgment. And, it, and again, it's just a huge question to me. Is there a time we don't have to listen when a leader is clearly appointed by God. And even more so if we're not sure if the leader was appointed by God. Is it enough? And again, these are just my questions. These are just my, I'm just throwing things out here, okay? I'm not trying to convince anybody to my side. <clears throat> but, you know, do we just say, okay, this person's been ordained by the conference or the union or the whatever, does that mean we listen to them no matter what? Do they have some kind of special authority that we don't? And in some ways, I would say, yeah, that is true. You know, and even when I even when I wrote these notes before, um, you know, my my own thoughts about it are not as clear as they should be. And I struggle with this idea because I have seen, you know, I worked for the church for seven years. And I did see how it works on the inside at times. And, and it does seem people, some pastors get ordained more quickly. Some wait nine years. Some get it in two years, you know. And I, I don't know. You know, I don't understand why it's so unreliable. Anyway, 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 anyway. That's just one of the things in the story that, it just, it just begs the question for me, is there any a time when that should happen? And we're going to kind of answer that, at least in my mind, we're going to kind of answer that in a second. Okay. All right. Let's get to verse nine. You know what? Let's read nine and 10. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. So you wonder, were they not contrite? Did they not ask for forgiveness? Did they just flat out not realize what they were doing? And, and, you know, you know, how kids are sometimes. Did they not realize that God was talking to them? Kids, kids get that way sometimes. Rather, right? are, are they talking to me? You're not talking to me, are you? You can't be me. I'm not doing anything wrong. I, I don't know. I wonder about this. So the anger of the Lord was aroused back to scripture. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. Verse 10. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, Suddenly, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was, a leper. Okay, God's anger burned against them, but only Miriam gets punished. So some people might say, well, it doesn't sound fair. Well, you know what? God knows best, and Miriam was the instigator but you wonder how Aaron felt, because remember we talked about a few minutes ago, had Aaron not sympathized with her, the whole incident may not have happened at all. And so you wonder if now he's looking at his sister going, whoa, what did I do? What did I do? I should have told her right away that this was crazy, but instead he sympathized with her and now well, leprous, you know, during these times, being a leper during these times was 
a lot of times what? It was a death sentence. You know, it was a death sentence in the ancient world, right? And not only that, well, we're going to see what happens in the story here. I mean, it was the it was the feared disease of the ancient world. I mean, there is no doubt about that. There is no doubt about that. All right. So here's Aaron looking at his sister. And like I said, I just cannot believe that there isn't some guilt in his mind and in his heart about what did I do? You know, I should have been, I should have stopped it. I could have stopped it. Much like the golden calf, who could have stopped it? Aaron, who could have stopped Miriam? Aaron. So Aaron does get a lot of blame here. I mean, there's no doubt about that. <clears throat> so then Aaron, now remember all the complaining and here's the great, here's one of the ironies of the story. <laughs> all the complaining they're doing about, they're doing about Moses. Where does Aaron turn to? Who is the first person Aaron turns to? Look at scripture. Look right here. So Aaron said to Moses, well, a few minutes ago, you were just complaining about Moses. You were backing your sister going, hey, how come we're not equal with Moses? But when there's real trouble, he's looking to Moses. And, and look what he calls Moses, too. But it's in the lower case. So, you know. So, Moses, so Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, that word of respect. That word of leadership, oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done finally some confession, some contriteness, all right? Please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned, okay? So he's actually talking about the sin and the punishment, okay? Don't lay this on us, please. It's like he's asking, you know, it's almost like a form of forgiveness. He's just saying, please don't lay this on us, okay? And then <clears throat> the word, I like this word that Aaron uses, we have done foolishly. We have foolishly made this mistake, okay? Then he goes on in verse 12. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. Okay. He's, he's like, my sister's been sentenced to die. Please, please don't let this happen. You know, please don't let this happen. But I want you to think, you know, I want you to think about this. If God had just let this go, if God, if there was no punishment on Miriam at all, what is it going to breed? I mean, the people were already, they already rebelled many times before we get to this part. And if they know there's not going to be a punishment, just like we talked about with kids in public school, when they know there's not going to be a punishment, guess what? The same behaviors happen over and over and over. <sighs> Something had to be done. Something had to be done or else it's a free for all if people don't get punished, right? And then here's Moses, humble Moses, like scripture tells us, very humble, more than all the men who are on the face of the earth. Remember back in verse three. So here's Moses in verse 13, okay? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, oh God, I pray. Oh, God, I pray, please heal her. Even though there needed to be a punishment, right? There needed to be a punishment. And, and I want to share with you another quote here from Patriots and Prophets. Envy is one of the most satanic traits that can exist in the human heart. Remember, Ellen White's words, not mine. Envy is one of the most satanic traits that can exist in the human heart. And it is one of the most baleful in its effects. Says the wise man, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Proverbs 24, 7. And then Ellen White repeats what she said in the earlier quote. It was envy that first caused discord in heaven. Ellen White calls it a satanic trait, envy. When we're envy, envying other people, we think their life is better. We think they make more money. We think their car is nicer. Their home is nicer whatever it is, okay? Satanic trait. So it had to be punished. But even though it had to be punished, Moses sees, 
Moses sees the reconciliation that Aaron is calling for, and he prays out to God, please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, and he's referring to in the ancient world, you know, if she had brought dishonor to the family, she had been unfaithful or whatever it might be, okay? If her father had spit in her face, she would not be, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days and afterwards she, she may be received again, okay? Well, she's a leper and, and she has to, you know, uh, 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 remove herself, social distance, <laughs> from the rest of the group, okay? So Miriam, verse 15, so Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. I like that idea. I like that idea a lot because here she is, she's getting the punishment. It was her fault. Envy grew in her heart. She has her punishment. She was put outside of the camp, but yet, they still wait for her. It's almost like they said, we need to wait for our erring sister. Our sister has erred. Her punishment will not last forever. We're bringing her back into the fold. So we're going to wait for her after her punishment is over. I like that idea so much. It shows the mercy of God. Her punishment is over. She's been punished. She's seen the error of her ways but we're going to wait before we move on. I like that idea so much, okay? And you know, I wouldn't be surprised too, I'm just throwing this out here, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, she had to be banished, you know, there's, there's, she had to be banished because of the leprosy, but I also wonder if it's kind of a cooling off period for her as well. <laughs> You know, that she can kind of think about what she's done as she's been banished, you know, outside of the camp. And, and, you know, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's possible. I mean, think about what she had done. I mean, hadn't Moses, didn't Moses have enough problems? Didn't Moses have enough problems? All right. Now we're going to end with this quote. And, it, you know, and, and again, I apologize because... I, I wish my ideas were clearer on this and they are not, but I want to share this, what Ellen White says about appointed leadership, okay, appointed leaders in the church, okay, I want to share this quote with you. This is in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 386. Ellen White wrote, he who has placed upon men the heavy responsibility of leaders and teachers of his people will hold the people accountable for the manner in which they treat his servants. It seems pretty plain, pretty plain, pretty clear, right? We are to honor those whom God has honored. The judgment visited upon Miriam should be a rebuke to all who yield to jealousy and murmur against those upon whom God lays the burden of his work. Very clear. If they've been appointed by God, if they've been called by God, they are people we need to listen to. You know, we need to listen to. Okay. And, and what does she say? She says it should be a rebuke to all who yield to jealousy and murmur against those upon whom God has laid the burden of his word. So we have to be careful. We have to be very careful uh, of, of how we view church leadership sometimes. And, and here's how I decided in my mind, and, and here's, I'll, I'll close with this. I decided in my mind this way. If they have been called by God, I mean, even more so if they've been, been ordained by the church in, in some kind of leadership or teaching position, or, or especially as a pastor, whatever it might be, how do we decide when to remove our respect from them? Well, I think it's in the same way with our government or, or anyone or any entity as far as that goes. When they're going against the, the clear revealed will of God, then they should lose respect to the people. That's how I kind of reconcile it in my mind, okay? And, and for Miriam and Aaron, it was none of that. It was just plain jealousy. 
Moses had done nothing but what God had told him to do. So in that case, since Moses had done only what God had told him to do, and he was the appointed leader of Israel, Miriam and Aaron should have followed him without question. But just to repeat myself, if once a leader steps out of that, once they stepped out of following the clear revealed will of God in scripture, then they're probably no longer worthy of anybody's respect in the church. That's kind of the way, like I said, that's kind of the way I reconcile it in my own mind. Because like I said, Ellen White is clear. The Bible is very clear that God will hold us re- accountable if we're not respecting the leadership of the church, you know, in some form that, you know, if we're not, once those people have been appointed again, unless they step out of the clear revealed will of God, then they don't deserve respect. They don't deserve respect. That's, that's kind of the way I reconcile it in my own mind. But finally, I will close with this for sure, but that envy and jealousy of other people, causes nothing but problems. Like Ellen White said, that was the first sin in heaven. That was the main sin in heaven that caused the discord led to the fall of Adam and Eve. Anyway, we're going to stop there. Um, Happy Sabbath. I hope you have a great rest of the day and I hope you have a great week, upcoming week. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to pray about our story today. And I pray that the story reaches us in the right way. What, What part of the story speaks to us, I pray that your spirit will put it upon our hearts so that we can improve who we are and how we act. And um, we just thank you for all of the lessons you have in scripture. And we thank you that we are able to gather here today on your holy Sabbath day and talk about you. And we pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Okay. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you. Right, Dave. When are we going to see you again? What's that? I don't, on the fourth Sabbath? Okay, sounds good. Uh, the 25th. Dave's birthday. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say, do you know what happens on the 25th? It's Dave's birthday. Oh, it's Stan Lewis's <laughs> birthday, too. <laughs> by, the way, it's, uh, by the way, folks, it's Philip's birthday as well. Philip that I referred oh. to this evening, my friend, he's also yeah. on the 25th of December. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I thank you, everybody, for being here, and we will see everybody on uh, Wednesday. Yes. And it's so nice to see you there, Abel. And you tell Alice her name yeah. on the screen, so we want to see her yeah. beautiful face. Yeah. Well, we we see you guys every week. <laughs> we, we don't we don't speak to you guys, but we see you guys every Wednesday and Sabbath. Okay. Yeah. Well, now you can get on. We'll, we'll see you Wednesday night then, Abel. Yes. Yes. Good.